Uh, Sarah Diamond is the president of OCAD University. She's got a PhD in Computing Information Technology and Engineering, and a main digital media theory from the Institute of Arts in London. And uh, her accomplishments speak for themselves. I'll let you just <laughs> have me read it all. And what I find very exciting is she's actually also a co-PI on the Center for Information Visualization Data Different Design, which is uh, an initiative between OCAD and New York University, uh, advancing and exploring data visualization right here in Toronto. So I'm eager to hear more about that. but I'm sort of setting things up a bit by talking about whether there may be some proximity between infobiz and scientific visualization. Um, and I will um, start by just sharing a little bit about the Center for Information Visualization and Data Driven Design. It's um, a multi-year, um, fairly large project that involves the University of Toronto as well, so that's our third university partner. Um, and it has a lot of partners with uh, partnerships with industry and other data set owners. So um, we're looking at um, the relationship between technology invention and um, design practices within the emerging field of data visualization. There is a component of visual analytics in it, which is bringing in the cognitive science knowledge as well. Um, so visual analytics is a sort of emerging field out of data visualization and it has kind of equal weight between, I would say, the computational, so the kind of extraction pieces and the cognitive um, and then the human computer interaction um, piece, which is, you know, how do the users actually work with the data. Um, some of our partners do include um, UHN, a number of the um, uh, hospitals and um, work I'm not going to show um, is uh, by colleagues, including um, OK University researchers who are working on uh, uh, cancer visualization, efficiencies within the space of cancer visualization. There's quite a lot of research projects uh, there and, and some genomics, genomics research because I thought some of what I want to talk about maybe um, is best expressed through the work of my lab. So, um, so, you know, the challenge really that we've um, set up for ourselves uh, is um, discovery based on big data where patterns can't be seen until they're visualized, um, and really to try and find insights for working from data. Um, an area that I've always been interested in and kind of returned to as a field of interest is um, the visualization of personal data. And um, by that, I mean um, we're in... Um, a dataverse, you know, where there's so much um, data that we're consciously collecting and producing about ourselves, and then there's a lot of data that's being produced in and around ourselves, and it does sort of fit in the space of big data, but they're almost like smaller subsets of that big data world, and I think it's very um, relevant to bioinformatics, visualization, and genomics, because people are increasingly interested in understanding that part of their, you know, their personal history and their um, their uh, genealogical um, background and of course in the world of uh, medicine where we're um, looking at analysis coming out of our genomic data um, there's a lot of interest I think on the part of, um, of users and the public in that space and I think we're going to see more and more pressure to develop tools to really present that data in meaningful ways for individuals um, but also in that interface between clinicians and um, um, their, um, their publics, so their patients. Um, so um, big data, personal data, there's a, there's a strong relationship there. Um, I just wanted to start by, just this is my um, 
my winter snack. I don't have a cold. It's winter. So, excuse me while I sit away. So, just want to talk a little bit about what aesthetics are. Um, aesthetics are really the study and perception of sensory values. And um, as Alexander Baumgarten coined the term, it's really um, the ability to structure experiences in formal and perceptual ways and provide interpretive tools that can construct meaning. So um, sensory expression, often, most often visual, but sometimes sonic or tactile. Um, we had a, a nice session with some of the faculty and doctoral students and postdocs before this formal lecture. We were talking about singing cells and um, uh, ways that uh, medical researchers can actually distinguish um, the differences between cellular formation sonically as well as visually. So I think we're going to see not only visual analytics, but other kinds of sensory <coughs> perception entering the space. So really, um, sensory expression is the only means to perceive many contemporary data sets. And so aesthetics are really fundamental, if not additive to the emerging field of visual analytics. And I really appreciated the setup lecture because you expressed it very well. Um, but I think I'm going to also maybe go to some uncomfortable spaces, I hope, with, with some of what I show you. Um, because um, we're interested in some cognitive dissonance in my lab as well as um, uh, efficient, efficiency in cognition. So um, within that, um, the field of aesthetics, there's debates about subjectivity. Um, so Kant really introduced those versus the idea that there's universal transcendent values of Schopenhauer sort of positioned around that argument. Um, and these are present um, really within the field, I think, of data visualization um, and any kind of visual language, just as much as dialogues about universal versus culturally grounded cognition apparent in the field of cognitive science. So um, my field in data visualization is really um, very much about mobilizing perception, the knowledge of visual language, and data analytics. Um, so I come in part from um, a deconstructive tradition, so it's probably I may be speaking a language that's very foreign to those of you in the room, and I'll try and explain that. So um, again, we're just talking about this a little bit in the seminar. So I think what artists bring is, um, you know, we're trained to look at images and pull them apart, um, and to say, well, that image may feel and look this way, but this is how it's made, and this is its history, and. Um, it is uh, grounded in a kind of uh, set of assumptions that are cultural assumptions which allow us to read the image in this way. And we also, at least my generation and one that's um, you know, maybe a bit younger, tend to look at technologies and look at images as being produced by technologies and say that image is a production of that set of technologies which produce you know, that capacity to create that image. And, uh, Bruno Latour, who's um, you know, very, I think, well known for his work in, in the field of sort of science and technology studies, once said that um, science can be you know, re-read as a study of the history of instruments that produce scientific knowledge. So I think that artists and scientists in some ways share that, but um, we can, maybe scientists, when they're in the practice of producing science and producing its representation, um, are immersed in that practice and maybe don't think that much about every image that's produced or every discovery as being about that mobilization of instruments and science and the problem of objectivity and subjectivity, whereas artists think about that obsessively and constantly. Um, so that's the deconstructive tradition, <laughs> what I described there. And uh, Derrida, uh, who is a very important um, uh, cultural theorist uh, working with um, linguistics um, really looked at the language of expression and Latour, of course, analyzed um, the constructed nature of technology. So when I look at um, a visualization, I see it as being in part given and in part you know, made. So data visualizations carry with them the aesthetics and assumptions from your contributing technologies. So there's always a footnote attached to the image. Um, and data visualization technologies absorb the aesthetics now of 2D and 3D graphics, animation systems, which you were speaking about, and their formal styles and malleability. And new graphic tools, which are very exciting, you know, some many viable for online visualization, 
um, are available. And um, um, part of what we've seen, I think, within the space of visualization is almost a kind of mashup. And we have the capacity to mash up data sets as well, you know, that come from very different sources and are produced by different kinds of technologies. So part of what I'm interested in as a sort of field of study is, um, you know, what does that produce in terms of then what the visualization provides us with and, and how to read these images as both, um, you know, valid and useful for actual science work, but also um, ones where we always have to kind of have a footnote and, and awareness of how we're producing the image. So um, if there's anything I'm going to be really kind of reinforcing today, it's, it's less, less a sort of purity about um, bioinformatics visualization, because I think there's lots of expertise in the room at the university. Um, to speak to that, and it's more about like how do we think about these as images, and how do we learn from them, and, and how can that make your science better as well. Um, and so I, I have um, um, a number of um, visualizations that I thought maybe would be interesting because they kind of map onto photographic imagery, and they um, represent 3D vector field texture-based volumetric flows. Um, and this is a visualization of, of tornadoes. I, I find it just incredibly beautiful. Um, you know, it's a set of images, really evocative, and uh, at the same time, um, you know, it is using, um, you know, the photographic and then um, the animation, animation on top of the photographic, and I think that's really a set of technological conventions um, where um, it's not exactly realist um, because it has these technologies producing the image, um, and yet it's very easy to to read that percent potentially as you know this is a tornado as it flows. Yet it's a highly produced image, and I guess that's you know part of what I'm reinforcing. And yet it's very useful for understanding um, tornado flow data. And um, so you know advances in, in texture mapping, graphics um, capabilities make the um, images possible, and combined with depth sorting, illumination haloing, color attenuation, and that um, enhances perception and depth. And as I said, they're really aesthetically compelling, well, at least to my opinion, images. Um, and and, um, and then um, I, I love this. I like the idea of this Halloween um, storm. And these are um, radiation belts, um, where you can see what they are. Um, and uh, it's a 3D visualization of a solar storm that occurred um, in 2003 and it's from NASA's visualization lab. And it created a, a model, combined a model of the Earth with um, actual data, so daily, daily average particle flux data from the SAMTEC satellite. And it propagated the particle flux values along field lines of a magnetic dipole. And they used flux and field lines um, in a way that made them visible. It's meant to illustrate the ways that energy particles from the solar storm transform the star of the Earth's radiation belt. And design decisions, again, are really um, engaged within this. And, and I was reading about how the designers actually produced this image. And so they, they really thought through how to use color here. So the color scale on the cross section is violet for low flux and white for high flux. The translucent gray arcs represent the field lines of the Earth's dipole field. So there's a whole set of decisions that are being made in this um, production of this image that it's really important to understand and, and create both its legibility, but also I think it's sort of aesthetic resonance, because again, it's a, a really compelling you know, set of images. Um, and then, um, and this, um, I, I, I found this, oops, a little bit too bright for you to see it. Um, but it's, uh, again, a sort of, it's a, it's a figuration of um, the, uh, the solar system. And this is now increasingly abstract. So it's really using um, animation to be able to represent the solar system. And it's less photographic. And then um, um, this is one of my favorite images. It's a bit old, but um, when I was in um, uh, Alberta in my previous career, I was working very closely with David Wisher, who some of you may know his research. Um, and he, um, at the time, was really, in a sense, um, very leading edge in his use of animation, so the kind of stuff that you would love 
Um, and um, he was working in a very sort of nanotechnology space. And what I found really interesting about this work is because um, as a scientist, um, he's no longer using photographic instruments. So I see this real leap that happens um, between what happens in um, fields of science where there still is a photographic trace. And so there's this sort of um, realism and you're um, placing animation on top of that photo photograph and then you're adding you know, design capability to make it evocative. And the kind of work that David is doing in a sense where um, it works this line between simulation and visualization because he's using actual data sets, but um, he's needing to create this animated world in order to, uh, in a sense, illustrate and test um, the way that that data is functioning um, within his world of research. Because he can't see it, right? It's not the same as a photographic image. And I think that sort of intersection between um, the world of animation and um, the kind of abstraction or the realism um, and the sort of play with images is very interesting in your fields of work. And um, you know, deciding how you mobilize um, the capacity of animation you know, versus um, perhaps some of the imagery that we were looking at before. Um, and David has talked a lot about how his animations have helped him to um, make major discoveries in you know, the field of blood plasma research because they've allowed him to kind of navigate in a sort of sensuous and embodied way through that data in, um, that in a very provocative way that helped him to discover new insights. So um, this then moves into a little bit of the world that artists inhabit where you know, we think a lot about um, images as always being a set of decisions and never objective and always about a sort of subjectivity in the ways that um, the visualization is expressed. So um, we would probably argue that you should never think that a diagram is objective, <laughs> but rather that it's produced through instruments, conventions, um, and then, you know, the process of design and that you always have to work with it and lead it that way. And perhaps that gives more license to science than to say we're going to you know, work with images and ways of imaging that are more expressive um, and more uh, evocative and allow us to have more of an almost affective or emotional relationship to um, things like beauty and, um, and experience. So, um, Yeah, so, so formal strategies and metaphors, um, you know, were quite different in um, the examples that we looked at. And also I should underscore, which um, was helpful, I thought, in your talk, that each, um, each of these metaphors actually have different um, models of interactivity, whether they're passive viewing. And so aesthetics is also not only, you know, the image in itself, but it's also how we move through an image, um, what that experience is and um, um, how it functions cognitively because as soon as you're in an interactive space um, where you have to navigate, um, your sensory apparatus is engaged at another level than simply viewing a static image. So um, those considerations of kind of eye-hand coordination or embodiment if you're in an immersive um, space or visualizations that are immersive in a cave environment all of those also um, act on your perceptions and your ability to um, experience it through that space. I wanted to, um, just to throw in here almost for fun, um, a few really classic work by artist designers that you know, play up the use of metaphor um, within visualization. So, um, so I'm very interested in, in the use of metaphor and um, I will um, hopefully get to the point where I'm showing you some metaphor work from my lab. Um, and so these really are, are artists, designers um, who have computational skills, who have used metaphor in, in some way. Um, and this installation is by Joshua Portway and Lisa Orugina. And they created an environment that's called the Stock Market Planetarium. And it's quite a famous um, visualization work. And it was uh, commissioned by the Tate Modern in London. Um, and they worked with Bloomberg, and they were actually, uh, they were using actual feeds from the London Stock Exchange. 
And um, their original concept, which was like super great, was um, it was going into a restaurant next to the London um, Stock Exchange. And while you ate your meal, um, you would be able to watch this visualization um, play out you know, on monitors. And you would actually be able to, because all the stockbrokers were there, so you could be um, kind of betting on stocks. No, I mean, you, you could be doing your stock work while you were eating. And you'd actually see how the um, planetarium was, was changing. Well, for various reasons, that didn't work out. So um, instead, they ended up um, in the Tate Modern. And the way it works is um, it, they suggest this new kind of um, astrological universe of corporations and their stocks. And um, it creates a cosmology. So you actually begin to see these new formations and um, astrological formations um, um, within the stock market. And then they built, um, they worked with um, British Telecom and their um, artificial life um, programmers. And they built um, a series of creatures who would mutate, propagate, and die, um, live and die in the market. And they feed off the movements um, of the market and begin to force these sort of graphical transitions um, on the depicted universe. And um, they actually were running um, the simulation. Uh, no, they're running it. It was, real, it was an actual visualization during some of the more dramatic um, rise and falls of the London stock market. And, and at some points, um, the creatures would um, die completely and then they'd re revive. But you you'd actually would have this um, environment that gave you this incredibly visceral sense of how um, the stock market worked as both this sort of magical place and as a universe, but also as um, an objective space. And they were offered a lot of money by the Bloomberg's actually after they built it to actually use it as a set of predictive tools for the stock market, which I thought was like really funny. Um, this is another um, project that I, I like a lot by Golan Levy and um, uh, Martin Wattenberg, who's um, a very interesting uh, visualization researcher. He now works with IBM. He leads a lot of their visualization research at IBM. Um, and um, in this, it's the secret life of numbers and lives of numbers. They're trying to understand which numbers are free occur more than others to understand the relative popularity of every integer between zero and one million. They wanted to understand why this takes place, like why some numbers are more popular than others. And they were trying to link um, mathematics and repetition to human memory and social rituals and the structure of commerce. So um, Levin, who um, comes out of, he's a mathematician, um, as well as an artist. And he was, he believes that numbers are subjective and um, by implication data. And I'll just quote him. He said, humanity's fascination with numbers is ancient and complex. Our present relationship with numbers reveals a highly developed tool and a highly developed user working together to measure, create, and predict both ourselves and the world around us. Like every symbiotic couple, the tool we would like to believe is separate from us and thus objective is actually an intricate reflection of our thoughts, interests, and capabilities. So um, he's also playing with conventions of data visualization. He draws a lot on Edward Tufte, who was mentioned, thank you, and Colin Ware, who's a cognitive scientist who works a lot in um, establishing efficiencies in visualization. So there are rules of simplicity of display, and he wanted to comment on aesthetics and practices of um, visualization at the same time as it's a malleable and beautiful um, environment made up of data sets pulled from a wide range of search engines over a five-year period. Uh, this is uh, another uh, visualization um, that's uh, really kind of fun and interesting. And, and, um, this visualization sits next to a number of other visualizations using exactly the same data sets with extremely different metaphors. So that would be another point that I would want to make is that you can take a data set and you can actually express it in multiple ways in terms of the kinds of metaphors that you bring to the viewer. And um, again, we were talking earlier about how different scientific cultures have very different um, in a sense, metaphors, you know, ways of understanding data that are, are meaningful to them. And um, the idea of being able to express an interface that works for a chemist or a biologist um, with very different data is, I think, a very 
valuable proposition. So how do you build an interface that um, works for specific culture or subculture? What metaphors do you, do you use? Um, use? And in this instance, Julian Oliver, um, who's a really wonderful media artist, did a piece, created a garden essentially where um, you're, you can assign specific um, plants to um, packets, types of data that are flowing through um, your, your own internet um, correspondence, and your packets are measured and um, result in uh, the ability to actually grow and um, shape your garden. So it's a kind of data gardening, and um, it's a very popular practice amongst artists to build gardens with data. Um, and this is by Levnanovich using a very similar, um, uh, this is a network diagram, but he's also measuring packets. Um, and um, Lisa Jebret, who's uh, a programmer artist, built um, uh, a software environment with um, algorithms that artists could sort of jump into and um, design on top of. And so this is um, Manovich's idea of um, the beauty of the sort of network universe as it's emerging. And um, Delicious, you may be aware of Delicious, um, but I like um, all of these a lot. Um, as metaphors and images, because they they use um, they kind of mobilize a very organic kind of aesthetic. Um, this is a very kind of cellular, you know, really like in the body aesthetic to uh, to representing data that's um, flowing through the internet. And again, this is a sort of packet um, analytic. So. Um, um, I'm very interested in the ways that um, artistic and scientific visualizations, artistic and um, uh, information visualization can, can cross over. And um, there is um, an argument or a debate um, within the data visualization world um, where some analysts um, argue that um, because of the need to read data efficiently, um, that you should really segregate um, some beautiful expressions of data that are um, more abstract or metaphoric from a kind of convention in data visualization that's very direct. Um, and I think it's interesting to look at where um, those worlds actually cross over and, and the appropriate places for them to cross over. And these are just some examples of um, uh, visualizations. Um, this is Jared Clark's work. I don't know if people know his work, but um, he's a really terrific um, data visualization designer. Um, and um, they um, created um, this giant print that um, indicates all the code uh, that's used to produce a real tree. So it kind of reminded me of, um, of your work. You know? so, so in this instance, um, um, it's a completely animated environment that, um, in this instance, is printed as a poster, but it also exists as an online growing space. Um, and just some other examples, this is a heat map of um, sort of static visualizations um, representing listening habits of 70 different um, last FM users. And um, Chrome, some of you may use Chrome. Um, and uh, this is um, showing the evolution of the web over time. So I just gave this example because I think it's a really um, elegant um, visualization that's, that's quite legible because of the ways that it uses text to lock down um, the movement of different phenomena within the web. Um, so you actually have a legend that works, and yet it has a kind of aesthetic that um, is, um, you know, very engaging and powerful. Um, you know, one of the interesting discussions about the use of color and cognition is the suggestion that this comes up with the efficiency discussion that you should never use more than five colors within a data visualization. So. Um, how efficient this is, I'm not sure, but it, um, it's a really appealing and engaging So um, I've done some work. I'm going to try and um, just move incredibly quickly to some of the work of, of our lab. So, so I've done some work just looking at um, the metaphors of data visualizations that tend to be adopted by different sorts of practitioners. So what, what, do, what do artists and to use as their metaphors, um, what have de designers, they sort of separate out of designers because they were working more in the service of um, a scientist um, or a, a company that needed visualization and then computer scientists themselves who were 
building visualizations. And so I was just sort of curious to see, um, you know, which were the metaphors that seemed to come up from data structures consistently. And then um, these are just some examples of, of um, metaphors from my lab where um, what we were working on here, um, we do a lot of work with um, the Globe and Mail um, and with other media outlets and we've been looking at um, how to define um, the emotional tone um, and the kind of um, uh, rise and fall of certain kinds of articles and um, the emotional tone of those articles within different sections of the Globe and Mail. And so um, in this instance, um, the metaphor is a, a sort of topological map. So um, it's taking um, the Globe and Mail, which even in its digital form is quite a sort of static you know, environment. You know, you can kind of move um, in it by choosing um, uh, an article that's similar to another article. Um, but um, in this instance, we're, we're actually mapping that kind of effective content within the Globe and Mail. So, you know, where is there a lot of anger expressed? You know, where are the funny articles? And then creating the idea of a topology that you can flip through as two-dimensional space. Um, and then, um, again, looking at um, a content um, and the proportions of articles that have different sorts of emotions. So we're using a kind of color to represent those differences. Um, and again, using just sort of color to, to, to differentiate um, specific articles um, within the globe. Um, other metaphors, uh, so this is a set of sketching um, exercises that our lab undertook. So, you know, how could you think about emotion? What kind of metaphors could we use to express the kind of affective content of sections of the globe? And, I should say that the reason we're doing this research is that uh, understanding how uh, a reader experiences an article, how they um, judge its emotional quality, um, is actually quite important for things like um, attracting advertising um, to sections of a newspaper, um, understanding um, in a social media context, you know, how to better manage social media um, as a uh, a social media manager or an editor, um, and um, how to um, understand sort of the qualities that attract some readers and maybe repel others from parts of your media offerings. And then why people choose to read certain articles and why they don't. So we're really interested in that, and we're interested in how um, the sort of influence of an article and its emotional quality, um, you know, might be correlated. So in this instance, we're, we're, we're working with uh, different kinds of metaphors um, and um, the idea of, of water, um, which is a transformative media being used to express emotion. Um, and, and this one is sort of a block histogram, but um, Instagram. But what we're doing here, and um, one of my postdocs actually sort of sketched this, I like this a lot, it's the idea of a neighborhood. So it's taking um, you know, a newspaper and sort of turning it into um, a neighborhood that has certain kinds of topics, and then those, those um, parts of the neighborhood have a different sort of emotional quality to them that can be represented by a sort of urban view. Um, another metaphor um, in this instance, um, it's um, we've moved from water to weather, and um, it clearly, you know, kind of resonates with um, some very specific kinds of um, <clears throat> kinds of articles. So business, for example. So it's, it's using the weather, the weather forecast images. <clears throat> and so the idea, of, <clears throat> excuse me, bringing metaphors into the visualization space is that. Um, metaphors can become a way of translating information that's complex or outside of, um, you know, a per, a, an average person's um, understanding of that topic, or it can become a way of translating between disciplines, or even taking scientific information and, and making it available to publics that um, are curious about science but really don't understand um, what you're talking about if you speak in your own language. So um, I'm just a bit aware of our time. So I was going to talk a little bit about design methodologies, but um, maybe I should pause there for Q&A. So I think we're at about five to five. Yeah.
say about another five, five oh, minutes. Okay, that's great. So, so some of the work also that um, we're really engaged with in our lab is um, thinking about um, the methodologies of design. So we talk about data-driven design, and we also talk, um, you know, about user-centric design. And um, um, in data-driven design, some of what we're trying to do is to uh, work um, with our teams and um, uh, in almost a sort of formless way, look at that data, understand um, the context of the data, and then look at its structures, um, and then um, begin from there to imagine how that data could be expressed across a different set of metaphors. Um, and we're involved in an experiment right now where we're working with a major company who um, is engaged in uh, sort of doing data analytics um, for media companies. And um, they're really trying to look at how to provide tools for their teams that um, provoke insights, uh, new kinds of insights. And they found that um, with the tools that they've created, they just keep coming to the same kinds of understandings that are not really accurate and not really understanding where consumers or media is moving. So um, we've segregated, we have an experiment where we've sort of segregated our teams. And one team is working with the data without being given any sort of direction um, from the users. And they simply have the data sets and um, understand where the data came from. And then the other set of um, designers is working um, with the, um, the teams that are actually using existing tools and have a lot of knowledge about the data. And our experiment is to see you know, what kind of new tools and insights come from one method, which is you know, working without the users there in close proximity, um, and then what comes from the second method, which is working very closely with the users. And where this is relevant is that um, you know, a lot of use of data and data visualization is essentially illustrative. It, it's like, I have a hypothesis, um, get me that data set and um, illustrate it. Um, and so data visualization in that way is not necessarily being used to its fullest capacity. So we're suggesting that maybe if um, teams that um, um, have the ability to really represent the data but don't really know the hypothesis, can work with that data and express it, that new kinds of understandings may come out of it. So it's sort of early into that research, but it's really about a methodology around data visualization. Um, and it's been really, um, really interesting to kind of push it um, to the next level. And um, what we're doing in each instance is we're trying to create a narrative from the data. And Ben Fry, um, who's a really, um, great data visualization guy, and he and Casey Reed um, uh, created Processing, which is a very cool, sort of like Java um, visualization language, but it's easy to use, easy to learn, and extremely visual in its expression. Anyhow, one of the things that he said that was, um, I thought, very useful was, you know, the, the job is to really create a narrative from the data, so that, to tell stories from it. Um, and so with user-centric design, it's quite, you know, we're still following um, a kind of iterative path, which we do in our lab, where, you know, you develop the visualization, you find ways of testing it, and you're always testing for the accuracy of the data and how clean it is and those sorts of challenges with data. But um, with user-centric design, you're, you're very much engaged with what, do the user, what does the user want and how do we design for them. We involve in the participatory design process then we brainstorm, um, come up with ideas, then we sketch, then we go back to the user. So it's, it's very much about their vision of what that data should, should tell us. Um, so we're trying to understand, um, uh, we're also using this idea of usefulness that Bill Buxton um, uh, and Saul Greenberg um, have presented that we really like, which is not about usability, which is not whether the visualization is usable, it's whether it's useful. So in this instance, um, you know, what is more useful, in a sense, um, ultimately to the people who need to do the visualization, something that they iterate and, and create that reinforces what they already know, or something that um, might give them different kinds of insights, or what context works for what kind of discovery. So. 
Um, I'm not going to go through all this. We talked about this um, earlier, and this is just a little bit of what's um, emerging from the work in terms of um, user-centered design sketches. Uh, I have to say that um, the company that we're working with um, and the sketches, um, they've actually been really excited about both kinds of sketches, and um, they like the user-centered design sketches a lot because I guess for the first time they're working with designers and artists, and so we're emerging these quite beautiful, engaging ways of working with their data. So we may have confused our research a little bit because um, we're getting you know great feedback from both ways of working because they're not used to having visualizations that are evocative and you know dynamic ways of working with the data. Um, but um, yeah, these are some of the. So this is um, coming from the um, the user centric way of working. Um, so it, it, it's a sort of relatively, so we're, we're looking at this, we're doing this sort of slot and into these sketches. And then, um, again, just sort of looking at um, ways of, of um, representing your data. And then uh, this is from the um, uh, design data, data-driven methodology. So um, this is working in much more abstracted ways um, in representing clumps of data and the idea of a cosmology again, um, in which the data can be represented and they can very quickly see a little bit like um, the uh, stock market planetarium that I showed, you know, how different users are flowing with the data which they sort of analyze in real time. And then this is um, kind of similar but even more abstracted. Um, and this one has um, hit maybe the top popularity uh, chart in terms of the company's response. So it was the idea of actually um, building a, a kind of physical interface with um, mobile phones that would um, show the data visualizations um, in a wall at the same time as it was actually playing with the sound coming from um, um, coming from the, the radio stations that were, that were being analyzed. So the idea of a kind of physical embodiment of the data. So you know, I'm going to just stop there because I think um, I think we uh, provided you enough food for thought, and you can take some questions and comments. Hi, go ahead. I was just wondering, uh, what do you do when you have uh, when you use a user-driven design, but you have more than one user, like the users have different goals and or needs. Yeah. Um, that's a really great question, and um, some of what we do is we sketch um, different kinds of interfaces for each set of users, and then we bring we use sketching to look at to create something visual and tangible, and then we bring the user groups together and say, um, you know, how do you feel about each other's Sketch, and often we've been able to find a point of similarity um, between the users. Or we try to build a, an interface um, that um, um, includes different perspectives in it. So you can actually um, extract the data in different ways and translate that data into a visualization that fits one set of users and a visualization that, that, that serves another set of users. But um, I think the challenge is to make sure that each set can understand the other's visualization if they need to collaborate. Yeah. So, uh, in art, where so much of what we produce is subjective, and, and yet the, the masterpieces just stand out, the, 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 they, they harmonize, they, they achieve the holy grail. How do we know when we're on target and when we've missed? How would the engineers at, 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 at Thornton, Morton, Thickiel have known uh, their data visualization was a complete fail versus Edward Tufte's simple scatterplot genes? Um, do you have any tips? Do you have any thoughts? Or uh, well, um, I mean, I, I think part of it is um, I think that's the point where your user group or your audiences are so incredibly because um, I think you're, you're, you are hoping to have that aha moment 
where people go, wow, that is really beautiful, or that really speaks to me. Um, but at the same time, I can say, and I understand it, it's meaningful. So I think we're constantly navigating that space between that's very beautiful, that's a powerful image, and that's a meaningful image. So I would say that's the most important grail in the space is something that's you know, formally evocative and, and also meaningful. Um, I think with um, artistic visual, data visualizations, um, if you added, if you look at the Nanovitches and you added text to that data, same with a lot of Ben Fry's work, um, as soon as you lock it down with text, it becomes meaningful. And um, you know, one of the great tricks um, of art is you take the text out and it becomes an abstraction or the metaphors that speaks. So I think there's an interesting relationship between um, text and image, or text and icon at the foot of our earlier conversation of the icons are meaningful, where you can lock something down for people and make it meaningful at the same time as it's powerful and popular. What do you think? Well, I just, I keep picturing that there's, uh, there's a, a little display at a uh, science center where you put your coin in and it goes around and around and around and around the circle until eventually it drops in. And I, 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 mean, I feel like the work that we do, we, we keep going around and around and around, hoping that we're going to get to the center, but something, sometimes something happens, you fly off the edges. <laughs> so I, I don't know. It, it's, there's no magic uh, prescription that I, I, a series yeah, of guidelines. I think another challenge also is that people just have very different levels of visual literacy. And so you're struggling with that. And that's really true in 3D space and 3 space. You know, some folks, I mean, when you look around the demographic of the room, probably people who grew up playing, you know, computer games are incredibly comfortable in 3D space and, and navigating in that space and managing that and manipulating and, and people who haven't grown up in that space, you know, it's, a, it's an acquired skill. Um, so I think we're also dealing with that challenge of, of different sorts of literacies and um, ensuring that we have a shared kind of literacy um, and, and that that literacy is understood in terms of the communities we're designing. Yeah. Well, so Sarah, it seems like so much of what you do is to take the unfamiliar and then put it into a familiar, visualizing in a way that, that, that relates it to a familiar context. And it, 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 uh, uh, some of it is, is familiar, familiarities that we have with, with data, rep data representations that we're used to. We're used to timelines because yeah. we've seen them since elementary school. Yeah. We're used to scatter plots. We're unfortunately used to column charts. Very. Uh, but every so often somebody comes up with a new visualization which, like, like the heat map, which is relatively recent, I think, which for a while is, you know, uh, a lot of people have trouble understanding, they've never seen it again, and then it sort of penetrates, people become familiar with it, and then, aha, it becomes one of the metaphors you use. How do you go about discovering the new paradigm for visual or oral or whatever display that, think, will, that will then take root? Yeah, I, mean, I think that's a fantastic question. And, um, um, and, and we're, we're working with this sort of notion of metaphor in my lab, but I think it's also very limited because, you know, in computer science, there is this way of working with metaphors which you take the familiar in and, and you use it as a bridge. Um, and so um, I think part of it is, is it's no significant over the answer, but I think part of it is by sketching a lot, you know, by just, you know, working with the data sets and trying to understand what that data is and, and sketching and sketching and sketching and then people have breakthroughs that way. It may seem like a very abstract, weird way to, because I don't think there's a science, well there is a science you know, to this which is essentially sketching and taking yourself away from metaphors and brainstorming and, um, um, but, but that kind of physical act of sketching I think or mocking up is, is really important here and, I, mean, I think that's how heat maps emerged was, you know, wow, that's just a great concept. So this is quite, it's quite conceptual, right? And how um, a new kind of visual language will emerge. So I think it really is, uh, and it's also about not it's being trial, trial and error. And I think it's, it's, I think it's not being afraid, you know, um, to break visual conventions as well. Um, 
Yeah, okay, we're about to do some work with RD and Connors who just come up with a, uh, people who know this, but they've just come up with an absolutely conventional language for um, essentially business analytic um, visualization. So they've been working on this forever. They've been top tier cognitive sciences and scientists, and now they've got this language which is going to be in all of their software. And you know that is how you're going to be able to represent data, all kinds of data. It's very flexible with your inputs, um, and um, it kind of comes from many eyes. I don't know if you know that it's a website worth checking out where you can feed in your data sets and you take it to the next level. And um, we've actually taken on, I think, the project of trying to break their aesthetic. So what we're going to try and do is, is suggest how they might be able to build into Cognos uh, more experimental ways of working with data sets. So um, you're not just showing the same kind of you know, representation of data. Because um, I don't know, our hypothesis is that if, if you use the same language, just as you said, then people are so used to reading that that they're not necessarily going to have you know, breakthrough realizations and always the same way to visualize the data. But I think it is partly um, a very much as well. Yeah. So, yeah, because you're talking about you know, visualization as a language, it seems to be that like how how you, which language you choose it depends on what pattern you want to make. So it seems to be a circle, right? Because like in science I think part of the important thing is to see existing data and facts in the way that nobody has seen it before. But you you try to sort of present it in such a way which is familiar, I think that sort of um, so bias to the perception in a way that, I mean, for example, um, when people used to think that um, the sun would walk around the world, the earth, and then you have very complicated circular patterns, but after circles. So, I mean, suppose you go ahead and build a visualization tool based on that, so that people will look at it and say, okay, let's look at the circular patterns in that. But then, of course, the answer is that actually, you know, it's a cool question, a much simpler you think of walk around the sun. Right? Yeah. So, so, so then the question is like, I mean, not knowing what you actually are going to discover, what kind of pattern you're looking for, like how do you build a visualization tool, which is so specific. That's my question. Yeah, and I guess the way that we we've, we've tried to um, address that is using multiple strategies. So one is using metaphors and and saying, you know, what are multiple metaphors that we can use to apply to a data set. So which in a way breaks that expectation. Um, and the other is to use visual abstraction, you know, which is very much working from the structure of the data and um, drawing from that structure. Um, what I didn't show you um, was some work that we've been doing um, in trying to address quite linear data that's come from, um, again, our colleagues at the Globe and Mail and the way that they currently have structured movement through the paper, and so um, we've observed that people in the digital space actually sample a lot more. They, they, they actually use digital media in ways that are in defiance of the current structure of the ways that um, digital media is organized. So we used um, um, a set of theories that, that come from um, sort of discourse theory, um, Michel Foucault, and um, ideas about the rhizome um, and rhizomatic forms of knowledge. Um, and we actually built these data visualizations, which they are quite beautiful, um, but which allow you to navigate that content in really, really different ways. And this maybe does work with your idea about you know, how do new kinds of concepts emerge. So we really were working with the data and also how people actually are interacting with that data. Um, in, in opposition to the idea that you know the world is flat, right? Um, so it really was a combination of sketching out of that data, looking at structures, and then, then finding the right, I guess, metaphors or more like um, analogies around structural analogies that we thought we could then apply to building those visualizations. Yes, uh, I also have a question about the data-driven science as opposed to hypothesis-driven science because. I, it, it seems to me that like, a lot of this is very interesting. It's like somehow you're not really sure what you're looking at. I mean, it's not efficient. But someone brought up the Challenger example, right? But I'm surprised that Feynman wasn't mentioning that because Richard Feynman was the one who found that it was wrong and 
I did wasn't formed by any any fancy graph or whatever. I mean, it's just basic physics. I mean, I mean, this, okay, this, is, this is a problem. It's just a demonstration with the wall that we exposed. So I think isn't there a danger that like synthesis is mock of data so that you know, people may not be sure what they are looking at. So we so go on this fishing ships trips and what they come up with they may not be very useful scientific. I mean, I'm not saying that we're not, it's not, but I'm saying that it's such a danger. I mean, I think that's, you know, a really important fundamental discussion in, in this era. Um, but there are data sets that are so large that, that you, you can't work with them except through being able to see them. So visualization almost becomes absolutely a requisite for working with that data. So I think it's a huge responsibility, actually. And, you know, we know that visualization can lie. Um, but also it's about maybe balancing different methods of working as scientists, you know, between hypothesis and the kind of empiricism of working with data. That's always been a challenge in science, so, you know, what's new, but, um, um, and in a way what, what some of, you know, the data-driven methodology can be very formalist and traditional. Um, so uh, I, I think we have to be very careful with that. And there's a sort of third space, which is the one I, I maybe should have shown, which is this work we did using the idea of the rhizome, and, and which was quite theoretically driven. It was like a conceptual art piece in many ways. So it was strongly conceptual. It worked with the data, but it kind of challenged the way that structure had been produced and came up with something very different, which it turned out was actually very useful to the client we were working with because they'd never thought about their data that way and when we showed it to them they were like oh my god of course